one of the big topics that comes into the conversations of Jesus is money comes on a variety of ways it comes into his stories the parables comes into his one-off comments it comes into his encounters with people because it was such a big deal as it remains today such a big part of the way that we live and the culture that we live in and I was reading this book about first century Palestine and the the key social issue was debt so to speak about money is appropriate and pertinent and relevant and do you remember that moment when somebody calls out from the crowd lord tell my brother to divide the inheritance fairly between us and he said be on your lookout against greed you know he he gets drawn into this situation even though he says it's not his concern and then think of holding up the coin and saying saying give to caesar that which is caesar's give to god that which is god's coming into the social business of money and how you handle it and how it handles handles you so he does it in a comic way he does it in a humorous way and he does it in a a powerfully uh, cultural critique type of way uh, but here's the big one here's the one that really sticks in my mind more than any other Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. What's your take on it? Well, he had a lot to say about money because then as now people can be so driven by the need and desire for money that it becomes a compulsion and jesus talked about it in terms of servitude you cannot serve god and money okay and it's this moment here you can't serve two masters is money your master does money master you and the the term we're more familiar with there in that last phrase is mammon you cannot serve both god and mammon and that reminds you that this has a demonic background there's there's a evil spirit component to this servitude it's not just a matter of social compulsion, but something even worse, perhaps. Also, we note that it's not a question of whether we serve, but whom we shall serve. I think it was, wasn't it Bob Dylan who sang that song? You got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yeah. Okay probably in c major okay so what or who is mammon so it's defined as materialism and worldly gain it's material wealth being regarded as having an evil influence and it's being personified as a false god quite often we use the, the word the devil these days in some conversations even with like non-believers who are not really exhibiting a belief in a personal bad a, a, a personal force of evil so much as a symbol of of an evil influence or evil addiction so to rephrase the verse we could say you cannot serve both god and the false god of money materialism and worldly gain so how do we know if we're serving this false god so i was reading this book called wealth riches and money i picked it up because i thought it was how to get it but mostly it's to do with how you do without it okay and he the author says there's 10 symptoms of mammon's influence in our lives so see if see if you've got one <laughs> see how many you've got out of 10 okay worry and anxiety 
out over money. Ding. All right. Money mismanagement. Consistent financial lack. I never have enough. I can't afford it mentality. Alternatively, impulse buying or stinginess, withholding money or doling it out in penny increments. Greed, an inordinate desire to acquire or possess. Discontentment, bondage to debt. You know, one of the really great moments in my in our in our marriage was to actually take the credit cards and to scissor them in half and never go back to them that's quite a few years ago now but it's it's a, a challenge to do and it's a challenge to maintain and then finally an exaggerated emphasis on money that's maybe the most significant, including an overestimate of its real power or overstating the benefits of having it. I think it was Bob Hope who said, I've been poor and I've been rich and being rich is better. <laughs> so, well, who could who could answer that? And, and, and there was another quote when he was saying, I just want to have the chance to prove that I won't be spoiled by having millions. Yeah. You get the idea. So even those jokes are a kind of cultural comeback to a deep rooted desire, an exaggerated emphasis upon money. So where does Jesus fit into this? Now, most of us would have succumbed to at least one of those 10 at some stage in our lives. But the real question is, how much do we succumb on a on a regular basis? And really to, to revert to that point i made just a moment ago it's is is this a compulsion that is moving towards an addiction are we serving god or mammon and i think if we're honest we're often serving mammon in that book that i was referring to the author calls shopping malls the house of mammon and we have this phrase retail therapy and if that is really the case <laughs> if you're comfort buying then then well if that was i need to reconsider the the habit if that's happening if the shopping center is the house of mammon in my life then 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 stay away stay, stay away I remember this guy trying to explain the phrase lead us not into temptation and he said for me it means don't go down the chocolate aisle in the supermarket you know just avoid that whole street yeah avoid temptation keep away and if you found that in your life you've been serving mammon rather than god then i need to reflect on the verse and reconfigure my decision making and repent and then the second thing is that jesus makes the point that god tests the handling of money before he commits spiritual riches to us we're not quite sure what that means yet but there's a really powerful phrase here you know god examines us and works with us he negotiates based upon the way that we use the money that we have I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you may be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Isn't that fascinating? You might want to think about that a little bit, talk about it. But here's the one here. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And you might like to consider, what does Jesus mean when he says true riches? And it has to be really the fruit of a relationship with him. I'm going to I want to tell you, he said at one point, the secrets of the kingdom. And you have to have like soil that's rich and ready to prepare, not shallow, not rocky not mixed up with weed seeds but ready to receive prepared soil and 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 that stage of readiness 
is like in this in this different analogy here, a trustworthiness and your trustworthiness is is exemplified by the way you handle what you've got already. Because money itself is not evil. And remember, that's often misquoted in the Bible, isn't it? They say money is the, the root of all evil, but it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. Money can be used to feed the hungry, educate people, or to, to uh, for, in terms of mission. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. So your stewardship, the way that you handle your money, determines whether God can trust you with the real stuff. And Jesus mentions two kinds of wealth in Luke chapter 6. First, there's the unrighteous wealth, money that God gives to each of us. He's the one who causes us to prosper, but God owns all of it. He gives us wealth so that we can buy the basics to meet our needs, food, clothing, shelter. But he also gives us wealth so that we can enjoy things that go beyond the basics, maybe bonus wealth. Okay, so you probably don't think of yourself as as poverty stricken do you what do you think scale of one to ten well of course as soon as we spread it out and look around the world then we soon realize that we are among the very privileged the top percentile way up there you might consider you know a look up at sort of bill gates or someone on, and think elon musk and say wow you know what must it be like to buy a company for 45 billion you think what and then on the scale of that you don't feel very prosperous but if you have money in your pocket to buy lunch if you have an indoor toilet and if you drove your own car to church you are wealthier than 80 percent of the world's population that's worldly wealth but it came from God. God is the author. God is the creator. And the main reason God gives us worldly wealth is to test us, to see if we can manage, manage life. But he speaks in this text of another kind of wealth, which he calls true riches. If you are trustworthy with a little, God will entrust you with a lot. You can be trusted with true riches. Things like peace, security, and joy. Things so valuable that they cannot be bought at any price. So what do you do with those? How do those things enable you to live? Remember Jesus telling the story of the rich fool who had acquired a great deal. And he said, what do I do now? What do I do now? He said, well, I'll build a bigger barn. And I get even more and I'll just pull it all in and I will contain it. And I, 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 it's mine. And then God says, you fool tonight, your soul is required of you and all that you possess is going to be given to others. And so there's this transitional quality to money that Jesus is talking about saying, so what are you going to do with what you've got while you have it? Okay. So the question is, are you managing God's money wisely? Can God trust you with more? Just going to leave it there, but I'll send the clip so you can follow it through. Just wanted to pick up on this one here. Here we go. It's just a little quote from John Wesley that my mum used to quote. <laughs> so here you go. Here it is. John Wesley used to say, Save what you can, spend what you have to, and give a little away. Okay. And it's roughly taken from John Wesley's sermon, which is called On the Use of Money. And he stated a famous sentence earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. There's a wonderful picture of him at 86 years old going in the snow through London, collecting pennies for one of his orphanages and just using his time, using his dwindling energy to do good. Earn all you can, save all you can and give, give all you can. 
Well, let's leave it at that. Let's have a discussion now and think about how money impacts us, how its compulsion drives us, this concept of manum, and what stewardship means. What does one God want to do with my bank account? All right. May God bless you as we think together on these things. Amen.